This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a conversation between Aneta and Charlotte, first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Notice that an example has been done for you. This time only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Hi, Bill. This is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. The student is in first year science, so you write science on the form. Now let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Hi, Bill. This is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you, Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part time work. Now I just have to complete your details on the computer.、Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E. Yes, J O H N S T O N E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street Student Residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's one twenty six. One two six. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers. Or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's o four one four eight four seven seven four eight. I'll just check. No, sorry, not seven four eight. It's seven four nine. O four one four. Eight four seven seven four nine. Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose. Though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though. I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. Okay, well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation, and kitchen work, and pizza delivery. If you've held a driving license for twelve months, I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? You now have some time to look at questions six to eleven. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions six to eleven.
Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7 p.m. and I'm supposed to finish at 11 p.m., but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3 a.m. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9 a.m. lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays, but they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick, so they couldn't get to the bank, but they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence, but I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Um... And this childcare job that just came in this morning, do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3pm. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now, four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia to a man called Rob, who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15 on page 67. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Joanne? Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well... Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that... 
we've got the same laid back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20 on page 68. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5. But it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden... It's over 100 years old and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest, a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there.
that's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north, then if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students talking about a lecture they have just attended. First, look at questions 21 to 24. There are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. Henry, don't you think Dr Adams' lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is a brilliant lecturer, but he puts them under a lot of pressure. Mm. But don't you think that's good? Perhaps. But I am glad to have Dr Adams as a lecturer. He's interesting and rather funny and puts just the right amount of pressure on people. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting. And sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow! Your notes are so neat. There's not much Arabic. There is on this page. Oh, yes, there is. Dr Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he was talking about. Don't you keep careful notes? Mm, sometimes. It depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams's lecture today, but some of the detail will fade. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 25 to 30. I type up everything afterwards so you can have a copy then and you can fill in anything I have missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before I can get the concepts clear in my head. And I am the complete opposite. I find all the detail clutters up my mind, and I get very frustrated, which was just what he was on about. He mentioned a book he had written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual? Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. So it is. I think I'll get that out of the library or, or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't really. Oh, yes, it was fascinating. 
I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent, but they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling? You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on. Do you know which way is north? It's um that way. You see, I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike and put me in a completely new place, and I am totally lost. What about maps? I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order, and I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. Okay, we can do that. Which way is the library? It's.、Oh, you're making fun of me. <laughs> That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Now you have half a minute to read the questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today our guest is Joseph Parks, medical director for the Botany Department of Mental Health. He's going to give a lecture about the research on teenage brain. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to introduce the new research about adolescent mind, the teenage brain. How much do you know about that? Do you believe in brain scanning? Do you think we can judge whether a teen is normal or mentally ill, or it's just another immature test? The new research shows a teen brain is in the middle of disordered changes. Those changes, scientists now believe, are so significant that they may reveal the mysteries of mental illness, explaining why some teens commit suicide, why others harm their classmates, and why some emerge later in life with mental disorders. The research looks forward to a day when teens could be tested for suicidal depression as easily as they are for heart disease. But there are signs that society and parents, in particular, would reject such a tool. Many parents question the validity of a mental health diagnosis. They fear that their children will be falsely tagged with a mark that he or she is abnormal. At the center of the debate is the teen brain, its confusing architecture, and the difficult question of what's typical in a teen and what's not. Under the old thinking, the adolescent brain was fully formed, needing only to be filled with facts, figures, and experiences to become an adult mind. At the same time, many people rejected the idea that young people were even capable of developing mental illnesses. However, the new research shows a teenage brain is an organ in transition. 
It has an unstable and vulnerable composition. The evolving teenage brain clearly isn't adult-like until the early 20s. If teens act young and stupid, it may be because brain areas that govern rational thought are not mature yet. All that is fine when the brain develops normally. But if the teen brain fails to successfully reinvent itself as an adult brain, mental illness may happen. Researchers increasingly believe if that process stops for some reason, teens are likely to develop mental illness. Early warning signs might be disregarded, as adults may think them the typical teen behaviours. Perhaps the chief hope of the new research is that it could make a difference for teenagers suffering from mental disorder and major depression. These can lead to suicide, which for years has been the leading cause of death for teens. Until recently, scientists couldn't peer into living brains to look for changes associated with normal development or mental diseases. That is beginning to change as researchers develop ever more sensitive brain scanners. However, the composite pictures are somewhat misleading. A snapshot of an individual brain may fall somewhere between normal and mentally ill. For now, psychiatrists and psychologists must still rely on interviews and observations of children's behaviour to diagnose mental illness. That is the end of part four.